What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you're having a wonderful day. The ATIT's version seven mathematics portion has two parts. The first part we're gonna cover in this video and that is numbers and algebra. Let's get started. So as always, we begin by looking at the objectives. Specifically, what is it that I need to know to pass this exam? Well, there's gonna be a total of 18 questions out of the cumulative 34 questions for the mathematics portion. And what you're gonna to need to know is converting among non-negative fractions, decimals, and percentages, performing arithmetic operations with rational numbers, comparing and ordering rational numbers, solving equations with one variable, solving real world problems, applying estimation strategies and rounding rules to those word problems. And then when it comes to solving world problems, you're gonna to need to know how to use proportions, ratios, and rates of change, as well as expressions, equations, and inequalities. So we're gonna begin by looking at fractions, specifically the relationship between the numerator and the denominator. So fractions can be written in the form as A, over B. So typically on your exam, you're going to see A over B, right? Where A and B are both integers and B is not equal to zero. You can never have a zero at the bottom of your fraction. Integers are set of whole numbers and their opposites. So the bottom integer is called the denominator and the top integer is called the numerator. The line between them represents division. So A over B really reads as A is divided by B. So for example, for the fraction three over four, the numerator is three, right? That is that number on top. That's our numerator. And then our denominator is four. That's the number on the bottom. So how do we calculate percentage? So a percentage is a number or ratio expressed as a fraction of 100. It is often denoted by using the percent sign, right? That's that beautiful sign that looks like this. That is our percent sign. So for example, we have 35%. We know that 35% is equivalent to the decimal of 0 0.35 or the fraction 35 over 100. To calculate a percentage, we're just multiplying that decimal by 100 or we're dividing the fraction by 100 to reduce it into its lower terms. So as you can see, if we were to divide this by 100, right, 35 over 100, we're just going to move the decimal place over two times. So we have the number 35. We know we have 35%. This is where our decimal would be because we have a whole number. And we're going to move it over two times. One, two. And because we have a decimal in front of a number with nothing um, in front of that, we add zero. So 35%, right, is gonna be equal to 0 0.35, which is also equal to 35 over 100, as we outlined in our example. Sometimes you're gonna to have to identify place values with decimals. So every digit in a number has a place value associated with it. The place value of a digit tells us that the digit is worth in relation to the other digits found within that number. So for example, we have 1,234 here as an example. There is a total of four digits with place values in the ones place, place values in the tens place, place values in the hundred place, and place values in the thousand place. So as you can see, our one falls in the thousand, our two falls in the hundred, our three falls into the 10, and our four falls into the one. To find the place value of a digit, you need to look at its position in that number. The place value of the digit will be the base, right? So that's that 10, 100, 1000, so on and so forth, to which that position corresponds. The decimal part of a number can be read using place values as well, so anything behind a decimal. The place values of the digits to the right of the decimal is tenths, hundreds and thousands, right? We have our decimal place here, tens, hundreds, and thousands. So for example, we have the number zero, um, I'm sorry, 0 0.035. So this is where our digits fall. So our zero falls in the tens place, our three falls in the hundreds place, and our five falls in the thousands place. 
All right, so let's get started with the fun stuff, right? That's that conversion of one thing to another, starting with fractions to decimals and percentages. So in order to convert a fraction to a decimal, we have to divide the numerator, remember that's our top number, by the denominator, which is our bottom number. So for example, we have three over four, right? We need to convert that uh, to a decimal. So how do we do that? We divide three over four. With a simple calculator, you are gonna have on your ATITs, once you do that division, you're gonna find that it is 0 0.75. Now we also need to convert fractions to a percentage, right? And as we talked about before, we're simply going to multiply it by 100. So for example, we have a decimal. Um, we already figured out what our decimal was with three over fourths, right? We divided that, it was 0 0.75. So 0 0.75, we have to convert that to a percentage. And we do that by moving over our decimal. So if we have 0 0.75, we're going to multiply that by 100, which means the uh, decimal is gonna move to the right, not the left. When you divide, it's gonna move to the left. When you multiply, it's gonna to move to the right. So now we have 75% because our decimal falls behind our whole number. So let's take a closer look at converting decimals to fractions. And how we're gonna do that is in order to convert a decimal to a fraction, we have to divide the decimal by the place value of the decimal part and remove the decimal from the numerator. So how do we do this? So we have a fraction I'm sorry, we have a decimal that we need to convert that is 0 0.75 to a fraction. We are going to divide 0 0.75 by 100. That's the whole number because that 75 falls, that last number falls in that hundredths place, right? So we're going to divide our 0 0.75 by 75 over 100. And that is going to be the answer to our fraction. However, we can simplify that fraction into its lowest form. So with 75 over 100, we have to figure out what number can we divide the numerator and the denominator by in order to get the simplest forms. Well, in this particular case, 25, the number 25 is easily dividable with 75 as well as 100. So when you divide 75, by 25, you get three. And when you divide um, 100 by 25, you get four, giving us the answer of three fourths. Another example of converting a decimal to a fraction can be, in this particular example, we have 0 0.584. Well, we have an additional number, right? So we can't divide it by 100. This time we have to divide it by a thousandth, right? Because that last number, falls within that thousandths place. So in this particular case, our 0 0.584 is gonna become 584 over 1000. And the last conversion we're gonna look at is converting percentages to decimals as well as fractions. So we start by converting our percentage to a decimal. And we talked about this before. If we divide, we're gonna move the decimal place to the left. If we multiply, we're gonna move the decimal place to the right. So as we can see here in our example, we have to convert 75% to a decimal. How do we do that? We divide, we put 75 over 100, right? We're gonna divide that. So we know that we have a whole number of 75. Any whole number is gonna have the decimal place after the whole number. And again, we're dividing, we're gonna move it two times to the left, one, Two. Our decimal place goes in front of our 75, but now we no longer have any placeholder before that decimal, so we have to add a zero, right? So that gives us 0 0.75. And then lastly, we convert our percentage to our fraction, and we kind of already did that in our previous example, right? So now we need to convert 75% to a fraction. So how do we do that? We place 75 over 100, because as we know, our percentages are typically 100%, right? 75% usually falls within that 100. So again, we can simplify this, and we did this before, and how do we do that? Well, we go ahead and we look for that common number that we can multiply, or I'm sorry, divide both our numerator 
and our denominator by in order to get a simpler term, a simpler fraction. And we know that that number was 25, right? So if we divide 75 by 25, that gives us three. And if we divide 100 by 25, that gives us four. So our simplified fraction of 75 over 100 is three fourths. So we're gonna start moving on to order of operations. The order of operations is a set of rules that determine the order for which operations occur. That's addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc. The order of operations is often abbreviated as PEMDAS. So the P stands for parentheses first. The E stands for our exponents. That's our powers and our square roots. Our MD is multiplication and division. So anytime we have multiplication and division, in one of these order of operations questions, we move from left to right, okay? We don't do multiplication first or division first, it's whatever falls on the left, and then we just move our way down to the right. Same thing with addition and subtraction. We start from the left and move our way over to the right. So for example, and it's a little hard to tell, so I'm gonna write it out, we have three squared plus two squared. Which operation should we perform first? Is it the addition or the exponents? Well, as you can see, based on what we have here in our uh, PEMDAS example, we're going to do the exponents first, right? That is the very first thing that we're going to do. So three squared is equal to nine. It's basically three times three. And two squared is equal to four, right? Now all we have left is addition, and that part's super easy. Nine plus four is equal to 13, and it gives us our answer of 13. So we had a pretty simple problem before. Now we're gonna get a little bit more complicated, right? So this is multiple step problems. So we're gonna begin by looking at our example, and our example is 24 divided by 12 plus 17 minus 11. So how do we do this? Do we have any parentheses? No right? So we don't need to worry about parentheses. Do we have any exponents? Not that I can see here, right? So that is also a no. So now we have multiplication and division. And remember, we talked about that before. We're going to move from left to right when we're looking at multiplication and division. In this particular case, it's a little bit easier because we only have one form of the multiplication and division, and that's division. So we start with that. 24 divided by 12 is equal to 2, right? 12 times 2 is equal to 24. That can also help you get there as well. So now we have a problem that is 2 plus 17 minus 11. So we move on to our addition portion, right? So again, addition and subtraction, we move from left to right. So in this particular case, we have 2 plus 17. That's equal to 19, right? And then we have 19 minus 11, and that is equal to eight. So the correct answer for this multiple step problem is going to be eight. And lastly, we're gonna take a closer look at operations with parentheses. So we have our expression here. We have parentheses 15 minus 12 plus 18 divided by parentheses 21 minus 11. So again, we just moved down our PEMDAS, right? So do we have parentheses? Yes, absolutely we do. We're gonna move from left to right. So 15 minus 12 is equal to three, and 21 minus 11 is equal to 10. So now we have eight, a three plus 18 divided by 10 is equal to what? So now we're gonna take a look at this. Do we have any exponents? Again, moving down the line, no, no exponents, right? No powers, no square roots. Do we have any multiplication or division? Yes, absolutely we do. So what do we do? We have 18 divided by 10. That is going to give us 1.8. And we just keep moving our equation down. So now we have three plus 1.8. What does three plus 1.8 give us? It gives us 4.8. So the correct answer for this operations with parentheses is going to be 4.8. Let's take a closer look at defining rational numbers as well as irrational numbers. We're going to start with those rational numbers. 
So rational numbers are numbers that can be expressed as a fraction a over b. Remember we talked about that before. a and b are both integers and that denominator cannot be equal to zero. That is, they can be written as a ratio of two integers, if that makes sense. So we have an integer on the top, integer on the bottom. The bottom number cannot be equal to zero. So some examples of this can be negative one half. This can also be written as negative 25 over 50, right? If we were to simplify it in its simplest terms, that's what it would equal. We can also look at three fourths, right? That can also be written as 75 over 100. We've done a ton of math problems so far with that example. We also have 0 0.125. Remember that last number five falls within the thousandths place. So we have to divide it by a thousand. So that can be rewritten as 125 over 1000. We have negative 0 0.75. Again, that five falls within the hundredths place, right? So we divide it by a hundred. So that can be rewritten as negative 75 over 100. And then lastly, we have negative 15, uh, which here it's listed as an example that can be written as negative 15 over 100, but that's absolutely false. Just ignore that. But we can see that negative 15 is a whole number, making it a rational number. So now we're going to take a closer look at irrational numbers. So irrational numbers can't really be expressed as fractions. They'll never truly be equal to what they're expressing. This means that they cannot be written as a ratio of two integers, right? So for an example, pi. Pi you're going to see all the time. And while it is written here as a fraction, it's not completely equal to that fraction, right? Because pi is such a long number, there's just no way to make it into a fraction. You also have the square root of 16. The square root of 16 is one of those weird numbers because there really isn't such a whole number that's going to be equal to the square root of 16. So while we do have an approximation of it being equal to 25 over 41, it's not exactly equal to that. And then lastly, we have E. This is approximately equal to 27 over 28. You see this all the time on your scientific calculators when you're doing those calculations. However, E is not really equal to that 27 over 28. It's just an approximation. So that's how you get irrational numbers versus rational ones. So how do we put these rational numbers into order? So rational numbers can be ordered by least to greatest or greatest to least. In order to put rational numbers in order from least to greatest, we line them up in order from left to right. The numbers are larger as you go from left to right, right? So your negative numbers are least, they're going to be on your left, and your positive numbers are going to be greater, they're going to be on your right. So we have an example here of negative 15, negative 0 0.75, 0, 0 0.125, 1 half, and 3 fourths. That is how we go from least to greatest. What I would suggest is when you're taking the test that you convert these numbers into fractions or into decimals. Probably in this situation, it would be better to do it in decimal points. Um, that way you're able to see um, specifically that 1 half and that 3 fourth being greater than 0 0.125 and how that goes down the line. So again, go back and review that if you're still having a little bit of trouble and we'll do some practice questions. Um, in order to put our rational numbers from greatest to least, we're going to line them up from right to left, right? So the numbers are going to be larger as you go from right to left. So in this case, um, you've got 3 over 4, 1 half, 0 0.125, 0, negative 0 0.75, and negative 15. So all we did is literally reverse it. Our greater numbers are going to be on the left, and our more negative numbers, are that's going to be our uh, lower numbers, are going to be on the right. When you're ordering negative numbers, remember again, like I said, that smaller number um, is going to be wherever that least is. And then those more positive numbers, those are going to be the larger ones, are going to be wherever the greatest is. There's also a case of absolute value of negative numbers always being less than the absolute value of positive numbers, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So now let's look at comparing our rational numbers. So sometimes we're going to have to look at rational numbers and compare them by their relative size. That is, which number is larger or smaller than the other? 
So for example, if we compare numbers negative 15 and negative 1, because negative 15 is less than negative 1, remember we just talked about that, the more negative the number, the less it is, we can write it as follows. Negative 15 is less than negative 1. You can also find the answer by using a number line or plotting your values. Sometimes that'll be available to you. Therefore, the value that is farthest, right, away from the center is going to be the lesser number, right? So as we go all the way to the left, that's usually where your negatives are, the farther left you go, the lesser the number it is. The closer right you go, right, the closer back to midline, it's going to be greater because as we know, when we're looking at a um, graph, as we move to the right, the numbers get more positive, And as we move toward the left, the numbers get more negative. Some of the symbols that you're going to see that you're going to have to be very familiar with are the examples that I have listed here. So we have the sign for greater than. The easiest way to remember this is that, remember Pac-Man? Pac-Man is going to eat the biggest numbers, right? So whatever number is bigger, it's going to eat. So we have greater than, and then we have greater than or equal to. That's that little dash that falls behind the greater than, right? We have equal to. We're very familiar with equal to. We use it all the time with our math equations. We have less than or equal to, right? We talked about that before. Less than or equal to, again, it's going to be eating the bigger number. So if your number on your left is greater or I'm sorry, is less than the number on your right, then your little Pac-Man is going to be facing the other direction, right? It's going to be facing the other way, eating the bigger number. And then we have less than, which here, it's not listed right. It should just be this. And again, there's no line underneath it. It's just less than. It's eating the bigger number. So if the number on the left is less than the number on the right, then the little Pac-Man is going to be eating the bigger number, giving us a less than symbol. All right, so we're going to start looking at solving equations with one variables. And in order to do that, we have to be able to identify the terms of an algebraic equation. So an algebraic equation consists of terms such as a number, variables, or products of, that, of those numbers. Terms can be separated by addition as well as subtraction signs. So we have a constant, which is defined as the number itself. It's not attached to a variable. There's no x or y attached to it. We have a variable, which is a letter that represents an unknown quantity. We usually use X or Y. And then we have a coefficient. That is the number being multiplied by the variable. So let's take a look at our example here. We have negative 15 X minus 18 is equal to 30. Well, our consonants, as we know, those are those numbers that are not attached to variables is going to be 18 and 30, right? Negative 18 is not attached uh, to a um, variable, as well as 30 is not attached to a variable. And we say negative 18 because we just pull over that minus sign because it's gonna make the number negative. Uh, our variable, right, is gonna be negative 15 X. We know that because this is the only number that has that X attached to it. And then lastly, we have our coefficient. That is the number that's being multiplied by the variable. We already know that negative 15 X is our variable. So the coefficient, the number that's being multiplied by the variable is that negative 15. If we were to take the X away, right? We're only left with negative 15. That is what's being multiplied by our variable. So let's talk about inverse arithmetic operations. So the inverse of an arithmetic operation is an operation that undoes the original operation. So for example, the inverse of addition is subtraction, right? And the inverse of multiplication is division. The inverse operations of addition and subtraction are opposite of each other. And that's the same to be true for multiplication as well as division. This has to be true in order for an operation to undo each other. So for example, if you had something that said you need to multiply this, so let's say you had one plus X is equal to three. And you're trying to figure out what X is equal to, right? As we know over here, our one is a positive number, right? It doesn't have a negative in front of it. In order for us to isolate X, we need to get rid of that one over here on the left-hand side of the equation. How do we do that? 
we inverse the arithmetic operation. We're going to uh, subtract one from each side, right? So if we have one minus one, that is going to automatically cancel it out. Then we are left with x is equal to, we have three minus one, two. So as we know, x is gonna be equal to two. That is what we are talking about with inverse arithmetic operations, is we are either going to have to do the opposite of addition and subtraction, multiplication, or division. So let's take a look at another example. We're going to implement a sequence of steps in order to solve an equation. So to solve this equation, you need to find the value of the variable. In this case, the variable is x. We have no coefficient, right? There's nothing before the x. So we're looking at a simple equation here. So we have x plus 18 is equal to 30. So I'm gonna go ahead and just write that down here. So that way it's just a little bit bigger. Perfect. So now we need to isolate x. In order for us to identify what x is equal to, we have to remove that positive 18 from the left side of our equation. How do we do that? We just talked about it. We're going to use inverse arithmetic, right? We're gonna minus 18 from each side of the equal sign. So when we minus 18, positive 18 minus 18 is equal to zero, right? That gives us our x isolated on the left-hand side. So then now we have 30 minus 18. 30 minus 18 is equal to 12. So we know that our x is equal to 12. What I will tell you is always plug in your x to your original equation to see if it makes sense. 18 plus 12 is equal to 30. Absolutely makes sense. We can say for sure that the x, the variable in our equation, is equal to 12. So again, we're gonna take a look at another example and we're gonna be solving proportional relationships, right? That's equations and inequalities with one variable. So a proportional relationship is a relationship between two quantities in which the ratio of one quantity to another is constant or when one fraction is equivalent to the other. So let's just take a closer look at our equation here. Let's leave out all the verbiage and we'll just figure this out together. So we have six x is equal to 19, right? Well, again, we need to use our inverse arithmetic that we discussed before because we need to isolate x. Now before it was really easy, right? Because we had addition as well as subtraction. But in this particular case, we have multiplication, right? We have six is multiplied by x. So in order to isolate x, what we need to do is we need to divide it by six. And we're gonna divide both sides of the equal sign by six. So six divided by six is equal to one, right? So that helps us isolate our x on the left-hand side. Now we're left with 19 over six. That's pretty much our answer. Unless I wanted you to divide it down um, to a decimal point, we can say that 19 over six is equal to 3.17. But when you're taking your exam, most likely they're just looking for this um, fraction in order to identify that you're able to use that inverse arithmetic. Now we're gonna start looking at real world problems, right? Word problems. Everybody hates them. I get it, but we're going to work through them and hopefully we can figure them out together. The first step to solving these word problems is to read the problem carefully and identify the information that is being given as well as the information that is needed, right? There's always something that we need out of the information that is provided. The next step is to identify the problem type and the equation that needs to be solved. Once the equation is identified, then you can solve the equation. The last step is to check your work by substituting the answer back to the original problem. So here's an example of a word problem. We have a plumber who charges $25 for a service call plus $50 per hour for service. Write an equation to find the cost of a plumber's service if he works for H hours. So the first step is to read the problem and identify the given information, right? The given information is that the plumber charges $25 for the service call, that's a one-time charge, right? And $50 per hour for the service. The needed information that you need 
is the plumber's service for the hours that they work, right? That's that H. The next step is to identify the problem type and the equation that needs to be solved. And then of course our last step is gonna be checking our work by substituting the answer back to the original problem. So when we're taking a look at this, we know that we have to figure out the cost, we're just gonna use the letter C, for this particular plumber. We know that this plumber is gonna charge us $25, right? That's a one-time charge for them to come out. And they charge $50 per hour for them to come out to your house. So right away, we have automatically already put in our equation, right? We already know what it's gonna be. The total cost for this plumber to come out is gonna be that $25 one-time fee, and then $50 for every hour that they're there. If the plumber, let's say the plumber comes out and they work two hours, right? They're at your property for two hours. All you're doing at that point is plugging in the amount of hours. So as we know, we'll have C is equal to 25, that one time cost, plus 50 times the two hours. So if we times 50 by two, we get 100, right? And then we just have 25 left for the total cost. So we know that if this plumber was to come out to our house, fix whatever the problem was, they're gonna charge us a total of $125 if they spent two hours doing the work. You can do this by absolutely substituting your answer in for the cost and then performing it backwards. Otherwise, we already know the answer for this word problem. So let's take a look at solving word problems using percentages. So percentages are a way of expressing the number as a fraction of 100. We talked about that before. Percentage numbers increase or decrease in word problems. So in order to solve these particular problems, that involves percentages increasing or decreasing, you need to identify the following information. One, what is the original amount? Two, is the percentage increasing or decreasing? And three, what is the new amount, right? That's what the problem is looking for. Once you have this information, you can set up and solve your equation. So for example, we have an example here. If a store is offering a 20% discount on an item that was originally costing the person $100, the new price of the item would be 80% of the original price, right? It's gonna be $80, because as we know, we are decreasing, that's what, what that word discount means, right? We're decreasing 20%. So if we divide our $100 times 0.2, then we get 80%, right? We get, uh, or we get $80. Um, you can also, divide it by 0.8 if you were looking for the total cost as well. We know that it's the item is still gonna cost us 80% because we're only getting a 20% discount. So either way, you will get the same answer. It's just how you choose to find it. So here is a long, confusing one, right? We're gonna be looking at a percentage increase. So we're really gonna break this down. So the population of a town increased by 12% from 2010 to 2011. The population in town in 2010 was 20,000 people. The question is asking, what was the population of the town in 2011? So as we know, the original amount of the population in 2010 was 20,000 people, right? There was a percentage increase in one year of 12%. What ultimately is the new amount? That's what we're looking for. So to find a new amount, we have to set up the equation, right? So we're gonna have, we're looking for the new amount. New amount is equal to 20,000 because we know that was the original population uh, plus that 12% because we know that there was a 12% increase. So how do we figure this out, right? There's a variable here that we don't know. What is that new number? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply 12% by the original population. So if we multiply 12%, right, times that 20,000, it is going to give us 2,400. 
That is how much the population increased, right? So we know that based on 12%, we can use our decimal. We can move it over twice to the left. That gives us 0.12. We're going to multiply that by 20,000 people who were originally there to get what was that increase of the new population in 2011. However, we're not done, right? Because what the question is asking was what was the population of the town in 2011? That population of that town in 2011 wasn't 2,400 people. There's still that original 20,000 people were there. So now we're just going to take that 20,000 and we're going to add what we got um, from the percentage increase to the original population. So 20,000 plus 2,400 people, which was the increase, is equal to 22,000. 400 people. So based on this particular question, it's asking what was the population of the town in 2011? It increased by 2,400 people. The original population was 20,000, giving us a new grand total of 22,400 people in the population of 2011. So now we're going to move on to measurements. So metric measurements are going to be huge when you enter healthcare because we use it for everything. The metric system is a system of measurement that is used by many countries around the world except for the United States. The most common units of measurement in the metric system are length, we use meters, weight or mass, we use grams, capacity or volume, we, we use liters, and when it comes to any kind of temperature, we use Celsius. It's important to note that area is measured by square units and volume is measured by cubic units. We're going to dive much further into detail about the metric system in our other video, but it is something that they just touch base on with this particular portion of the exam. Next, we're going to move on to estimation and rounding of numbers. One way to increase your speed and accuracy on the ATIT's math portion is to practice estimation and rounding of numbers. This will help, like, help you quickly see the answer that should be in your head without having to do all of these calculations. So for example, if you're asked to round the number 45.687, I'm sorry, 0.678 to the nearest whole number, then you're going to be looking at the number that falls within the ones place, right? So we have 45.687. The number we are looking at is six, right? This is what falls within that ones place. You will need to round up the number to the tenths place, which is this one right here, um, in order to get your whole number. So what I will tell you is that anytime a number is greater than five or equal to five, you're gonna automatically round up. If it's less than five, meaning it's zero to four, then you're gonna keep the number the same. So in this particular situation, we have 45.678. We know that the number six is greater than the number five, so we are going to round up. So this particular equation is asking us to round to the nearest whole number our nearest whole number is going to be 46. However, if for some reason, say we had 45.45, again, rounding to the nearest whole number, we can see down here that four is less than five, right? It's not equal to or greater than five. So we would just say that the nearest whole number to this equation is actually 45 because we're not going to round up because we don't need to since the um, tenths place is less than five. So let's talk about proportions. A proportion is a ratio in fraction form that equals another ratio in fraction form. So when we're writing and solving proportions, we really need to use the following steps. We need to read the word problem carefully and identify all of the information that is being given. We need to draw a picture or a diagram to help us visualize what the problem is asking. We need to, to determine what quantity the qu equation is looking for. This is that unknown quantity, right? Those are those variables that we're trying to figure out. We need to identify two equivalent ratios in the problem. We need to write a proportion using the equivalent ratio, and we need to cross multiply to solve the proportion. And as always, we need to check our answers. 
So here is an example of a word problem that uses proportions. So let's say that you have a ratio of dogs to cats in a shelter that is 12 to 25. If there are 100 animals in the shelter, there we go, 100 animals in the shelter, how many of them are dogs? In order for us to solve this problem, we need to figure out what the unknown quantity is for the numbers of dogs that are in the shelter. The ratio is going to look like 12 to 25, that's what we did, and then 100 times x. We're trying to figure out, I'm sorry, x, not 10. Just kidding, times, and I'll just put it in parentheses so you can tell the difference, times x, right? We're trying to figure out the number of dogs that are in that shelter. So how we write this in regards to proportions is we write 12 over 25 is equal to x over 100. Because as we know, the ratio to dogs to cats is 12 to 25, right? We have 12 dogs and 25 cats. So 12, and then we have our x, we're trying to figure out how many dogs, and we have 25 cats to 100 total animals. So how do we solve this? So we do this by cross multiplication, right? So let me get a different color here. We are going to cross multiply these and cross multiply these in order for us to get our variable and our answer that we're looking for. So 12, so what it's gonna look like is 12, 100 is equal to 25, x, right? So now we need to do a little multiplication. So we have 12 times 100 is equal to 1,200, right? And then 25 times x is equal to 25x. So we talked about this before. We need to isolate x in order to get our answer. So how do we do this? We divide, right? We divide 25, divide 25, and that is going to give us I'm just going to write it up here because I'm running out of space. X is equal to 48. So as we know, there are a total of 48 dogs in the shelter. And if we were to plug in that 48 to our equation, it's going to give us the correct answer. Now let's take a closer look at direct proportions and constant portionality. So a portion is a direct portion of two equivalent ratios in the form of Y is equal to KX. The constant of portionality, that's k, is the number that represents the relationship between the two variables. So for example, you can have direct proportional equations such as y is equal to 3x, or y is equal to 10x, or y is equal to x divided by 6. You can also have not, direct, not directly portional equations such as y is equal to 5x plus 10 y is equal to x minus 15, or y is just equal to 5. That is how we tell the difference between direct proportional and non-direct proportional, right? With non-direct proportional, we don't have, we have another, co um, another constant, right, at the end. So y is equal to 5x plus 10. y is equal to uh, negative 15. y is just equal to 5, right? Whereas in our direct proportional, we have a coefficient and a variable, 3x, 10x, x divided by 6. So we're moving on to solving word problems using ratios and rate of change. So what is a ratio? A ratio is a comparison of two numbers by division. So for example, 4 um, to 5 or 4 divided by 5, right? So really, what is a rate, unit rate, and rate of change? How do we figure that out? Well, a rate is a ratio that is used to compare two different units. So for example, 60 miles per hour is also written as 60 miles, right, per an hour. The unit rate is the rate in which the second number in the ratio is one unit. You can find the unit rate by dividing the numerator, that top number, by the denominator, right? So again, we have this same example. 60 miles per two hours or 30 miles per hour. That's our unit rate. And then we have rate of change. And this is the speed at which something is happening. It can also be known as the unit rate. 
right? So we talked about that a little bit before. So for example, the rate of change in population, the rate of change in temperature, the rate of change in distance. So now we're going to look at using ratios and rate of change to solve problems. So when we're solving problems, it's often helpful to think about the relationship between different quantities in terms of ratios and rates of change. So for example, what we used before, if you know that the rate or the ratio of dogs to cats in a shelter is 12 to 25, and you also know that there is 100 animals in the shelter, then you can use these relationships to solve for the number of dogs in a shelter. You can also use rate of change to solve problems. So for example, if you know that the average rate of change in a population over a period of time is 0.02%, you can use this information to predict what the population of a city is going to be in the future. These problems are easily solved with a representation of a graph to plot out your points. These points usually form a slope within the lines. And lastly, we have expressions, equations, and inequalities. So what are expressions, equations, and inequalities? Well, an expression is a mathematical phrase that contains numbers, variables, and operators. So for example, we have 10 minus 2y. We have x, right? We have four parentheses x minus 16. Those are expressions. Then we have equations, right? And that's usually denoted by having an equal sign. So for example, 10 minus y is equal to 10. x is equal to 10. 3x minus 10 is equal to 4x plus 8. This is an equation because all of these have an equal sign in the equation. And then lastly, we have an inequality. That's the expression that contains those inequality signs that we talked about before. That's that less than, uh, greater than, less than, or equal to, or greater than, or equal to, those types of signs. If you have a difficulty understanding specifically what inequalities are, I highly recommend you go back and re-review that. Um, so that way you can tell the difference between which way the Pac-Man is eating the greater number. So previously we looked at solving a lot of equations, but we haven't really looked at solving inequalities. So we're gonna take a closer look at that to finish out this portion of our review. Inequalities are mathematical phrases that contains those inequality signs we talked about before. They can be used to represent situations where one value is greater than or less than another value. So for example, the inequality x is greater than y, right? Remember our Pac-Man is eating the greater number. That is how it's going to read. x is greater than y. Inequalities can be used to solve problems by representing relationships between two different quantities in a problem. So for example, we have x plus 2 is greater than 12. So just like with our other problems, we need to isolate, right, our variable, that x. And how do we do that? The same thing, that inverse arithmetic. We're going to uh, minus 2 from each side. So that is going to leave us with x is greater than 10, right? If we were to plug that in, that's going to make sense. There's also times when you're going to have to use, where you're going to have to reverse the direction of the inequality when we're multiplying or dividing negative numbers, okay? So with addition, we're not moving that inequality sign. However, if we are multiplying or dividing, right, negative numbers, then we're going to have to move our inequality sign. So let's take a look at this example. So in this example, we have negative 2y is less than negative 8. So in order for us to isolate y, right, we're trying to figure out what that variable is. What is y equal to? We are going to have to divide negative 2 from each side. And do you see why that is? Our negative 2 is being multiplied by y. So the inverse arithmetic of multiplication is going to be division. So by us dividing that, now we have y, right? We have y isolated. And on the other side, uh, negative 8 divided by negative 4 is equal to 4. However, because we divided that negative number, or multiplying negative numbers, whatever the case may be, we have to reverse our signs. So before, 
our sine was less than, right? So now our sine needs to be greater than. It is a rule that you are going to be, you're going to have to become very familiar with when you're taking your ATITs because they are going to trip you up with a lot of these inverse arithmetic questions as well as these questions with inequalities when it comes to multiplication and division. I hope that this information was helpful in understanding the specific portions of the mathematics ATITs version 7. As always, if you have any questions, make sure you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to www.nursechung.com where there is a ton of additional resources available over there for you. And as always, I will see you in the next video. <laughs> Bye.